Yeah, my name is Nader. I work with the Graph Protocol, and I'm here to talk about APIs. Fantastic. Yeah, and if you want to dive into anything else, um, you know, infrastructure related, Nader, go for it. Um, uh, I know, I know, you probably have a lot to say. So, yeah, well, I'll give you the stage. Cool. Yeah, I mean, uh, you want me to kind of just give an overview of like, you know, my general thesis around yeah. uh, what's yeah, out yeah. there, and then we can kind of get into some discussion. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Tell us. Uh, yeah, tell us the story. Tell us. Uh, what you know, Web3 infrastructure, what, what is it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can kind of say from a developer's perspective, coming into Web3, I've been writing code for like 10 years. I worked at startups as a front end developer. I ended up uh, getting into mobile development with uh, React Native, which is a framework for building uh, um, cross platform apps. So with a single code base, you can write for iOS and Android. And I was doing training and I had a consultancy where some of our clients were companies like Amazon and Warner Brothers and uh, Chase and Visa, where we would kind of go in and we would train their native iOS and native Android engineers how to kind of like write um, these full, these uh, cross-platform apps using React Native. Ultimately, kind of got a little burnout there and bored and uh, went into the cloud computing world, worked with AWS for a little over three years. And then most recently, kind of went down the rabbit hole of protocols and Web3 and the end of last, oh, I'm sorry, end of 2020, early 20, 2021, and joined the Graph Protocol. And, you know, using or coming from that background, I was looking to kind of apply the same ideas that I had in the Web2 space or quote unquote Web2 space into Web3. And for me, that meant I wanted to build out an application and I have these building blocks that I'm kind of used to using to kind of get me there. And using these primitives, I can build out 95% of the applications that I can think of in my head. And the other 5% are typically going to be um, specific to that, app, to that app. So it might be something like, oh, I need this machine learning service, or I need this, um, this messaging service, or I need this notification system, uh, or, or whatever. But the, the basic primitives were the same. You need a database, you need a server, you need a file storage layer, you need a front end, whether it be a web or a mobile app. Um, and kind of that, that, that would be it. You need some type of identity layer. You might use a hand rolled system or you might kind of use a um, software as a service or some type of uh, service, uh, something like AWS. So kind of trying to understand what that looked like in Web3 to me was, was kind of the way I was looking at this. And I think a lot of developers coming into the space are kind of taking that same approach. So that's kind of the way I usually speak to it. And it usually is, um, you know, easy for developers to kind of understand when you kind of break that stack apart, like what is that Web3 stack? And that's kind of been what I've tried to focus on over the last few months. Um, at Edge of Node, we even have a entire team of researchers of, uh, when I say an entire team, it's a couple of people that spent a lot of the last year uh, looking at all the different protocols that were out there and trying to understand where they fit in, trying to understand what the future viability of that protocol is. Like, is that a team going to be around a year from now? Is this something that they're focused on building and they're serious about? Or is this something that they're kind of just playing around with and trying to kind of understand, you know, what this Web3 stack look like? So I wrote a blog post called Defining the Web3 Stack. It kind of dives into this. But going specifically in the APIs, one of the reasons that I joined the Graph Protocol team, which is kind of uh, a sister protocol of Edge and Node is that they kind of provided a core piece of this Web3 infrastructure, which is the API layer. Because when I'm coming from the Web2 space, I have a server. And on that server, I can talk to a database. I can um, execute business logic. I can do things like filtering and sorting, or I can do data funging, essentially, kind of like data manipulation. But that server piece is kind of missing from the Web3 layer because we are interacting with blockchains and we're supposed to trust that that data is kind of the data that is there and when you have a centralized uh, uh, layer you're kind of like missing that important security uh, principle that you're ex you're expecting from a blockchain because if you're reading directly from the chain then you can expect that that data is there but if you have someone that's taking all that data centralizing in a server and then serving up in an API request how can you verify that data? So kind of the graph protocol offers this decentralized uh, indexing and querying layer. And that's one of the reasons why I joined this team is because I thought that it kind of filled 
this very, very necessary infrastructure piece for most developers kind of like trying to build out Web3 apps. And that's kind of what I'll probably be, be talking about most of the day. Like, um, why can't you just read data directly from the chain? Well, you can read certain data. So you can say, okay, I want to get data from this smart contract at this point in time. But let's say you want to do the type of query that you would need for almost any app, like Twitter, for example. You want to get a friends list or you want to get a, a filtered search. You want to kind of do some type of uh, filtering or sorting or data relationships. Like none of that is typically uh, able to be done directly from the chain. So how can you actually do that? And that's kind of the, the answer that the graph protocol is there to kind of give you, but also a question that a lot of developers, I think when they're coming into the space, don't really know where to look. And in the past, a lot of people would kind of build out their centralized indexing servers, which ends up being kind of quite a bit of work, but it also breaks the security principles around decentralization in the first place. Gotcha. And, and one question I had, Nader, Nader is, um, is that, uh, is the experience they would find with something like the graph um, familiar to Web2 developers coming into Web3? So the the actual primitives that you'll be using and with building out an API would be GraphQL, which is a schema definition language and, and a um, API specification that a lot of developers are probably already familiar with. Um, it was one of the reasons that it, came, it was easy for me to kind of learn it because I've been writing GraphQL at AWS for about three or four years. But I would say it's kind of not the main way that developers typically interact with endpoints. There's two main ways that developers, I would say in the Web2 space, use or, or two main specifications. One is just a typical like REST API where you have a, an endpoint, you send a request to that endpoint using like a GET or a POST request. Uh, a GET request would be reading data, a POST request would be like writing data. So you have REST and then you have GraphQL. So yeah, so GraphQL is, is fairly well adopted at this point. And then the other uh, language you would use is assembly script. And assembly script is very similar to something like TypeScript, which is uh, very, very widely adopted at this point. Awesome, awesome. And, and uh, quick quick question, you know, because we're, we're on this topic is, you know, what kind of things have you seen stem out of, of, of the graph, right? Like what kind of success um, or projects have you seen using uh, the graph? I'm, I know there are a lot, but I'm curious to hear from you. Um, you know, how, how have you seen people use that, um, uh, you know, that technology in a way that was maybe surprising to you? Or um, have you seen people really, you know, react to it and say, wow, you know, this is, um, you know, this is something I can use every day, right? This is a piece of the infrastructure that's been missing. Um, I'm kind of curious about those stories. Yeah, I mean, I think that most developers, when they start diving into uh, the stack and they start building something for themselves, they, they immediately run into this, this, uh, this problem. Like, how can I actually create these queries that I need for a real, real world application? Like, like I guess once you get past Hello World, you run into this, this problem. And um, almost immediately, they kind of start looking for solutions. And, and typically, when they find the graph, they're just like, they're just like, you know, sending out tweets, and they're like, oh wow, this is like solving my problem. Um, or they get excited and they just kind of talk about it. Um, some of the apps that are using it, uh, you know, the ones that are coolest to me, I'm a big fan of some of these mar uh, NFT marketplaces. So like Foundation is a really cool one that's using the graph. They even have a developer portal with their own subgraph that anyone can use and anyone can like uh, fork if they would like to. There's um, a lot of DeFi protocols like uh, like Uniswap and um, you know Aave and things like that that have subgraphs. There are metaverse plays like De uh, Decentraland has a subgraph. And um, so I would say just pretty much any, any uh, application that is deployed to a protocol that's supported by the graph can be can have a subgraph or an API that's built using the graph. So we support like a few dozen of the most popular uh, EVM networks like Celo, Avalanche, Optimism, and, uh, and, and Polygon, and, and Ethereum, and all those. And then we're now adding support for other layer ones. So we just rolled out support for Near, and we're working on support for Cosmos and Solana at the moment. Okay, awesome, awesome. And, and you know, I, I, I guess I have a kind of a... Maybe a similar question that I asked Lily, and, and you, you've touched on this a little bit, but it's, you know, what kind of challenges have you seen Dev2 developers moving into this space, you know, face? 
Um, are there some of the kind of, are there junction points where you've seen people fall off <laughs> and are there ways of saving them? Yeah, I think a lot of times we try to kind of carry our knowledge one to one or map our knowledge one to one from that space to this space. And we're just like immediately asking questions like, oh, I want to build this app in Web3, when in reality, a lot of times it doesn't make sense that way. So for instance, if you wanted to build out, out like a private messaging app that has very, very like a high throughput where you have maybe millions or even billions of messages coming in per minute, then uh, and these messages are private, then Web3 might not be the right place right now for that, you know, because you don't want those private messages obviously stored on a blockchain uh, publicly. Um, and you might say, okay, I'm going to encrypt those messages. But there isn't, I would say, a lot of best practices around how to do that at scale right now for the average developer. Um, so like, I guess trying to kind of map a Web2 application directly into Web3 is typically maybe not the right way to do it. Instead, it's kind of like, okay, let me learn these technologies and let me kind of build out some Hello World applications and kind of use them. And then I want to apply these ideas to um, maybe find a solution to a problem that exists as opposed to kind of like using these technologies to find a solution to a problem that might not exist. You know what I mean? If, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, is there anything else you wanted to touch on on the graph? I know, I know you're involved in other projects. I know, um, I believe you're part of the developer shop, correct? I, I don't know if you founded that or if you if you're a co-founder or or just a, a part of that. But I I was looking through that yesterday after the call, and I found that really really cool because I think, um, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll let you talk about it. But it it seemed like a really interesting approach to bringing a lot more people into this space. So I'm yeah, curious the developer the, DAO. Developer DAO, yes. Sorry, not developer shop. Yes, developer DAO. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, tell, yeah, tell I'll, me more I'll about talk, that. I'll talk about the developer DAO. It's a it's a DAO that was started about September, I think, of last year, and it's grown now. I think we have a, a little over five thousand developers there. We have investment um, and sponsorships that are kind of right close to a million dollars right now from um, a lot of different protocols and projects in Web three. And the main focus of, of the DAO is for a bunch of developers to kind of get together, share ownership of a community, build stuff, create stuff, and share it publicly and freely, and, and to kind of build out free and public uh, education and public goods. So what we've done so far is that we um, announced a big Web3 conference that's coming up that's going to be free to attend for anyone that wants to attend. We've created a few open source projects. Like we uh, have, when I say we actually have it, personally contribute to any of this code, but I'm speaking on behalf of like all the community members built out like a web three UI library. That's uh, I think we have over like 300 something stars and it's been downloaded like tens of thousands of times for developers that want to build out uh, front end applications on top of like web three. Um, a lot of tutorials and stuff have been created by the community. So we're still kind of trying to figure out exactly where we want to go with this, but it's just a great way for people to kind of get together, build stuff, um, learn together. Also, a lot of people have landed jobs and roles and stuff. And we even have a few people that are going to be employed full time by the DAO um, because we have now income coming in and stuff like that. So, yeah, if you're interested in learning more about DAOs in general, I would just recommend maybe finding one that interests you, that has something that kind of like speaks to your interests and just join it and then participate in it. No, that's great. That's great. And, and so what's some of the discourse around, you know, I, you know, obviously the topic for today is, is infrastructure and tooling, but you know, I, from an, it's awesome that it's open source, right? That that's at Agoric, especially, you know, we're big fans of that. And then uh, most people in the space are, um, you know, what, what's some of the discourse that's, you know, happening at the developer DAO and, you know, maybe that translates to the conversations you're having at edge and node as well. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to kind of, you know, we have a few minutes left, so maybe you can dive into that a bit. Um, some of those discussions that that you're having with the developers in that in that community. Yeah, so DAOs are kind of like a new way for people to organize and build teams, companies, projects, and communities. And we don't really have a lot of the tooling that needs to be there to make it the most effective. So we're kind of like using what's available to us today. That typically means um, for most DAOs, they are Discord servers that are token gated. And from within those servers, like people are able to communicate and, and create and come up with the ideas and build the stuff that ends up coming out of that. So I think there's a huge opportunity. And what we're already seeing is a lot of startups that are created to build out DAO tooling, 
because it's become pretty obvious that this is a very, very popular way for people to organize. There are DAOs uh, already created that have uh, multi billions of dollars of um, you know investment or capital or, or, or different different things. So, like the fact that these are so popular and they are already so effective with the limited tools and resources that we have today has kind of like sprung up this new, um, I would say, industry that's at, within Web3, which is DAO tooling. And you're definitely seeing a lot of projects that are out there. So that's a pretty cool opportunity in Web3. Um, if you're a part of a DAO and you kind of find a problem that, you know, uh, that you're trying to solve as far as how you're organizing or how you're voting or how you're collaborating, you know, coming up with a tool to solve that would be a, probably a cool thing to do. So I, I think just for the audience, for clarification, when you say DAO tooling, it's, it's building, building tools and infrastructure to better optimize and have better processes inside that decentralized autonomous organization, correct? That's right. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Um, and so this, you know, this is kind of a low hanging one, but I, you know, in the Web3 space today, what tools do you want to see exist that don't exist? I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I think that we have a long way to go as far as peer-to-peer -peer databases or what you might call like off-chain storage protocols. So if I want to build out an app, I have like this stack of primitives that I want to use. I want to use a blockchain as um, where I'm going to kind of have my on-chain data. I'm going to have a file storage layer, something like Rweaver IPFS. But let's say I want to build out something like Twitter. Um, where am I going to store those messages? Well, right now you can use something like Ceramic, but right now, Ceramic is, is really great, but it's kind of one of the only protocols that's out there that offers kind of like this piece of the stack. And it doesn't really have a great way to index and read data. So I think that in the future, we're going to see more um, peer to peer databases or more of these off chain storage protocols that are out there. Um, also, we at the graph are building out an indexing system for Ceramic. So you can kind of like use us to index that data and query it as well in a few months. So that's something that we're still like working on. So yeah, so definitely that part. Um, there's also a few areas like if you think about um, a, a piece of functionality that most applications have is messaging and notifications. So how do you do uh, push notifications or something like that in Web3? We don't really have a protocol for that. Um, and then lastly, video video storage. So IPFS works really great for file storage. R R we works really great for file storage but you probably wouldn't want to store a whole video there because of how expensive that would be. So if you want to build like the Web3 version of YouTube, like where would that video storage primitive be? Right. I don't think we have like a great answer to that. So I think that that's a huge opportunity. Um, I would check out LivePeer though. They have like a live streaming protocol that does video. I'm wondering if they'll offer that at some point in the future. Yeah, fantastic. I, I've, I, I have a few friends who are building games in the, in the, in the Web3 space and they, that is a big challenge. Where do we store all this data, um, animations especially? Uh, so that's, you know, for any listeners out there who are interested, that's a huge one to tackle that I know many people are looking forward to. Um, so, you know, Nader, it's great having you. Is there any kind of last words, last, last things you want to say? Uh, no, I think that's about it. I would just say if you're interested in, in, in understanding more about the Web3 stack, check out my blog post. It's pinned to the top of my profile called defining the web three stack amazing amazing thank you so much for your time today seriously Very thanks for having me